Personal conviction and democratic activism often go hand in hand. Today's guest is both a scholar of democracy and an advocate whose family members have long been vocal proponents of it. He's Mohammed Ali Kadivar, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to A Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. And I'm G. Wayne Miller with the Providence Journal. This week we're joined by Muhammad Ali Kadivar, a professor of sociology and international studies at Boston College. He's a student of democracy and democratic activism around the world, and especially in the Middle East. Ali, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. So we... We were uh, fascinated uh, by not just your own scholarship, but your family's history of activism, their commitment to social justice and democracy movements, especially in Iran. Uh, and so we thought we'd talk with a little bit about your family before we, before we dove into your, some of your scholarship. And in particular, we wanted to start with your grandfather. Could you tell us a little bit about him? Of course, yeah. Um, so my grandfather was a teacher in in the city of Shiraz which is in the south uh, in the south in the like center south of Iran you probably have drank the wine Shiraz which is not produced there but is named after the city of Shiraz it's a city of great poets such as Hafez and Saadi and I visited that city many times when I was a kid but he was a teacher during Iran's uh, movement to nationalize oil um, in which happened in 1950, 51, 52. Uh, Iran had a popular prime minister at the time, a secular liberal uh, person, Mohammad Mossadegh, who was educated in law. He led Iran's movement to nationalize oil, and my grandfather was one of the supporters of Mossadegh. Mossadegh was also a supporter of constitutionalism in Iran. So in addition to nationalizing oil, he was an opponent of autocracy. And he wanted, uh, he, he was a believer in the causes, in the cause of the constitutional revolution in Iran, which happened in 1905, which had multiple goals. One was um, to bring the rule of law, to put limits on the head of the state, which was the king, the monarch at the time, and also to bring development and prosperity to Iran and independence from uh, other countries. Uh, you probably know that in 1952, 53, sorry, in 1953, there was a coup that was sponsored by CIA. It was conducted by Iranian military. Mossadegh was toppled. Iran's Shah at the time, which, was, which had left the country because he had at the time uh, lost the power struggle to Mossadegh. He came back to the country as an autocrat. And many people went to prison. Mossadegh himself was uh, he was tried and he was in solitary confinement for three years and then he was put under house arrest until he died. My grandfather, who was a young supporter of Mossadegh, also went to jail uh, for a few days. And I learned about these stories uh, when I was a kid. Uh, so I learned very, from very young age about injustice, oppression, and the struggle for justice and for freedom. Do you have yeah. a sense? Uh, did you know your grandfather? Sorry, you got paused for. This. Sorry, did did you know your grandfather? Yes, yes, my grandfather is still alive. He so is. So I'm alive. I'm curious. Have you ever have, have you ever uh, asked him where his personal commitment to the rule of law, to uh, democracy, to social justice, where did that come from for him? I mean, it it also came from his father. He was, his father was a social entrepreneur and he was the first elected mayor of a small town named Fasa, which is next to Shiraz. He made a public park there that is still there. So imagine this is around the turn of the 20th century. This man in Iran wanted to make a park for his fellow uh, city dwellers to go and uh, have a good time in the park. 
So he did a number of activities for the city of Faso, and he also got into conflict with the landowners and the government at the time. So I think he learned it from his father, and my father learned it from him, and I, I guess learned it from uh, all of these people in the lineage. But so, this all goes back to the struggle for justice, democracy, independence, and development that we have had in Iran, I would say from 19th century until today. Tell us about your father. He is a philosopher. He's a professor of Islamic studies. He's a very learned man. He is still an activist, and he's now at Duke. Tell us a little bit about him. Yes, yeah, so he also, he was, he was born in a political household before the revolution. There was not much enough, there was not uh, much space before the revolution for open political activities. But because of my grandfather, my father was exposed to uh, criticisms of the monarchy and autocracy at the time. He was a participant in the Iranian revolution. He was arrested during the anti-monarchy demonstrations and he, was, he went to jail for a few days. And he, he was a, a student in uh, electric engineering in University of Shiraz, one of the best universities in the country. And he was so much uh, in love with the cause of the revolution, of the Islamic revolution, that he left um, his studies at university, he dropped out, and he went to Qom Seminary to study Islamic uh, jurisprudence. He was a believer in the revolution and the Islamic Republic, but as he studied more and watched the events, he became more and more critical of the trajectory of the Islamic Republic and the post-revolutionary politics. Uh, when I was in high school, he, he, was, he went to jail again, this time in the, in the revolutionary or, or post-revolutionary regime, because of his speeches and because of his interviews in which he had criticized uh, Iranian government for the lack of political uh, liberties. Um, one, I think, major contribution he has had to Iran's political development and oppositional movement is to offer a refutation of Islamic Republic's official ideology, which is Islamic ideology. But what is distinct about this refutation is that it is uh, within the tradition of Islamic jurisprudence. So he used the same sources such as Quran and Hadith Islamic tradition to argue that there is no legitimate Islamic type of government in Islam. And this was one major reason I think that uh, he was sentenced to prison because when you criticize the Islamic Republic from point of view of human rights or uh, values of liberal democracy, they would just dismiss this and say, these are uh, Western values we don't care about. But when they are criticized from based on the Islamic values and sources, I think that's when they uh, feel very much uh, in danger. So you, you you clearly followed in, in your father and grandfather's and great-grandfather's footsteps. You were involved in the pro-democracy movement in Iran before coming here. I have two questions about that. One, tell us about that and what you did. And the other question is, knowing this family history of of, of your your father and grandfather and great grandfather, did you have any fears being involved in, in pro democracy? I mean, they all went to prison for varying lengths of time. I would think, as a young man, that would at least give you pause. But why don't you tell us? I mean, I learned all these people that I respected went to jail or paid the cost for their activities. I have not been to prison but I've been living in exile and that's the cost I'm paying for uh, speaking the truth that I believe in and saying what I think is uh, needed to be said. Yes, when I was active, not only my, there were people from my family who went to prison, a lot of people I knew, a lot of my father's friends went to prison. Even my friends during college later, after I left Iran, went to prison. So there was all, yeah, there was always a risk and what you learn that they never give you freedom and justice uh, for free. It's anywhere in this country, in other countries, uh, when you gain freedom, it's after you have struggled and you have uh, paid the cost. So that was another thing I learned from very early age. So, so that this really is a tribute to the power of your convictions and your family's convictions that you're willing to take that risk. Uh, which, of course, we we applaud you for. Let's go to where you are today, which is the BC. Mm -hmm. 
and you run the Boston middle, College. Boston College. You, yeah. you run the Middle East Popular Politics Lab. Tell us about that, what, what you do there, what your folks there do. Give us a sort of an overview. Sure. So I'm working on different research projects at the moment. Uh, so I work on my own project. I have uh, three uh, graduate students that I supervise, PhD students. And there are undergraduate students that uh, work as my research assistants. One of the projects that we are working on right now is the Iranian Revolution of 1977-79 that we already talked about. So we are collecting some new data uh, on the, all the protest events that happened uh, during the revolution. Um, we are studying, so we are taking a historical look on previous protest activities in Iran, how they unfolded, unfolded what caused them and what were they, their consequences for changes in the patterns of development or repression in the country after the revolution. Uh, there is a comparative project in terms of the outcome of revolutions. So Iran is one on, uh, in this project. I'm, I'm comparing the outcome of revolution in Iran with other revolutions such as Cuban revolution, Vietnam, Algeria, uh, China, Nicaragua. And we are also looking at the contemporary protests that have been happening in Iran. Uh, there have been a lot of protests, political and uh, non-political, although everything gets political in Iran and elsewhere. But I'm talking about uh, protests waged by workers that are demanding higher wages or there are protesting late wages. Right now, a, a, a large wave of strike is happening in Iran's oil industry. So currently we are working on a piece about that. In addition to that, we are also studying the pro-government uh, rallies and I mean you can call it protest that has been happening in Iran. Probably when uh, General Soleimani was assassinated you remember the funeral that was held for him that hundreds of thousands of people participated. So that was a very large pro-government or government sponsored activity but those kinds of uh, events happen in Iran on a weekly base across the country. Uh, Ali, let's talk about the, the, the recent election in Iran and the state of the state, as it were, uh, inside the, Isla the, the, the Islamic Republic of Iran. What, what is Iran like politically today? This was a, certainly a very important election. Um, there was not much competition. So if we take two dimensions of that we can look for any political regime, let's think about competition and participation. Um, Islamic Republic has not been a democratic political regime. It's been an authoritarian political regime. But there has been a degree of competition between the regime elite and different factions that we have seen in previous elections. It's not been a democratic competition because factions outside the regime have not been allowed, but it has been a serious competition with important consequences for the country. In this election, there was not even much of a competition between elite insiders. So Ibrahim Raisi, who won the uh, presidential election, it was pretty much clear he is going to win there because uh, for candidates to run, there are two stages in the election. One stage is when people vote, but the more important stage happens before people vote. There is an institution called the Guardian Council, which is non-elected, who, who decides which candidate is qualified to run or not qualified to run. So they did not let any serious rival for Raisi to run. And there has been events over the last three, four years also that contributed to this. So the, the competition was very, uh, pretty much not non-existent. And um, government repression had heightened over the last few years, especially during 2009 when there was a hike in the price of gasoline. There were protests and the gov government uh, reaction was very violent and brutal. Uh, from what we know, in one week, at least 300 people were killed. The government used live ammunition when people came to the street. And there are larger number, like 1,500, but I'm sure at least it's 300 because Amnesty International has released name for these 300 people. This is very violent. Like I study repression and reaction to protests. This is even more violent than monarchy's reaction to revolutionary protest of 77 to 79. It happened in all in one week. 
So that was a shock for a lot of people who had voted for a reformist and there has been a reformist back president. And this was a betrayal to the promises that Rouhani, the current president who's finishing his term, had made. So that was a factor. Then there was the shooting of Iranian airplane, the Ukrainian airplane that a lot of Iranian civilians in it. The Iranian government lied first and said they didn't know what happened and it was found out after a few days that they shot the airplane themselves. And they said that it was a mistake. Maybe it was a mistake, maybe it was not, we don't know. But the lack of transparency and lying to people. Um, we, under American sanctions, life has been very hard for ordinary citizens. Uh, poverty has been increasing. Inflation has been very high. The currency rate has dropped. So people have given up to pursue desired change through political system, at least momentarily. As a result of this, we saw the lowest turnout for a presidential election in Iran since the inception of the Islamic Republic. Not only that, in terms of popular vote, Raisi also has gained the lowest popular vote for a first-term president uh, in Iran. He has increased his vote from uh, last four years that he ran and he was defeated by, by, by current President Rouhani. But as a winning president, his, his, his portion of vote out of the eligible voters is, is the lowest. So all this considered, I think Islamic Republic is moving towards reducing uh, factional competition within. All we have right now is the hardliners, reformists and moderates are defeated, they're out of power and uh, they're kind of demoralized. Uh, Keep a lot of supporters of reformists have disowned them and they don't see them as the carrier of political change or democratic change in Iran anymore. Maybe they will be able to reconstruct themselves or not. We, we don't know that. Um, but the trajectory of the government does not look good in terms of uh, it's moving towards a more repressive, uh, more unified, and more hardline government at the moment. So, so that's a good overview of the domestic situation in Iran today. What about Iran and the rest of the world? And I guess we could start with the United States, with, with the election of this new president. What, what do you foresee? What, what might change? What might not change? What's your you know, sort of crystal ball look at this? I know that, I mean, we know that the nuclear negotiations are happening, whether they result in certain out, it's possible that nuclear deal would be resuscitated and would be back. I mean, I don't know about the details of the negotiations, but I think in overall, I don't see a big change in America as a strategy in the Middle East. I think it's the bigger picture that is important here. Um, and that's what something that needs to be changed for these two countries or for the Middle East to, to have peace or relations. I can speak more about that, what I think is needed to change for the for the broader region or for broader strategy of the, of the two countries. Well, go go ahead and give us that yeah give us that sure. broader view. We'd love to hear it. Um. So there you, you you hear this question a lot. What should U.S. do with Iran? And I don't have an answer for that. But I think what needs to be changed is U.S. strategy for the region and for the world. So human rights or democracy or changing Iran's foreign policy seems to be U.S. priority. Iran and U.S. don't have a cooperative relationship right now. They have cooperated before. For example, during U.S. invasion to Afghanistan, we know that they cooperated. Iran shared intelligence and strategic information. There have been cooperation. There was nuclear deal. But overall, there has been more conflict over the last uh, 40 years. I don't think Iran has much different behavior in foreign policy from other countries in the region, such as Saudi Arabia or Turkey. So Iran is not a war, doesn't have a worse foreign policy behavior. All of them are bad, like I'm not supporting. I think none of them has been promoted peace in the Middle East. You, neither US, nor Turkey, nor Saudi Arabia, nor Iran. The problem is not like everyone is doing good except Iran or except the US. The type of interaction we see among these actors have not promoted uh, peace, democracy, or human rights in the region. I think if we want broader change those priorities 
uh, need to change. From my studies of democratization, I can tell you one factor that is very important and a promoter of democracy is the level of democracy in the region. And Middle East is not a democratic region. So right now, U.S. has relations with some of the autocratic, on some of the most autocratic governments in the region, Saudi Arabia, um, Qatar, Bahrain, um, Egypt. I think if U.S. is really committed to democracy and human rights, these are the places for the U.S. to, to start the change and to demand at least these states to let uh, civil society organization, labor unions to be formed for ordinary citizens to be able to have freedom of assembly, parties, organizations to, to be able to have their voice. We need to give more voice to the people of the region rather than the, the government of the region. There are other things also that can be done. One thing that is important, I think, is to provide universal internet coverage for the whole world. Um, so, you know, China has now developed their own system to put uh, strict restrictions on internet access and through that they exert a lot of control over Chinese population. And that is something that other authoritarian governments are also trying to do. Iran has been trying to uh, enforce restrictions on the internet and, regu and regulations. They, fortunately, they don't have the capacity that China has had so far, but they are hoping and they're trying to move towards that direction. So I don't think a targeted like provision of internet for Iran would be a good, uh, good policy because it could be seen as like weaponization of internet, but something under United Nations that as a, as a world, as all the humans, we decide that it's good for everyone to have access to information. That can help because in 2009 that I mentioned, 300 people were killed government shut down internet because they were afraid for people to to uh, record videos and send them out people did record the videos we saw the videos later i maybe they would have killed less if they knew it's going to go on the air uh, right away but these are some of the ways that we can help ordinary citizens on the ground i think iranian people have been the victim of um this power struggle between tehran and washington and bo in both countries, in some important occasions, factional, factional politics and factional interests have taken priority over the national interest. So what Donald Trump did, I don't think any expert in American foreign policy would say that served US um, national interest. But he wanted to give a show off to his supporters that he's tough and he's gonna pull out of the nuclear deal or violate the nuclear deal so he did that ali and i wonder can you speak to the power of activists to actually change repressive governments i i heard a another yeah. scholar of uh, of democratic activism sort of lament the advent of modern technology recently and she she opined that if you're not currently a democracy the trends and particularly surveillance technology are such that uh, you're not likely to see democracies emerge from those kinds of repressive regimes anytime soon. Do you think that's accurate or is there still progress that private individuals can make to change repressive regimes like that? I mean, when I look at the history of last century or last two centuries, I don't see any at any point that the struggle for democracy and autocracy stopped. You, you observe certain decades, democracy is pushing forward, and right now we are in an era of democratic recession. So we have a surge of authoritarian and autocratization in the world. And each new technology that comes in, initially, I think activists use that to take an edge, like during the Arab Spring or 2009 protests in Iran, we saw some innovative use of internet. Right. But your governments adapt soon and use that technology for surveillance. I mean, certainly internet and information technology has been a revolution in terms of communication, but it's not the, it is not the first technological revolution. We have had a telegram or telegraph before, telephone, radio, TV. So during the Iranian revolution of 77, 79, uh, tape cassettes were the main vehicle for revolutionaries to distribute and disseminate information about their activities. 
maybe at that time also we thought that now with the like the phones government can listen to everyone's conversation and stop political activities i don't think that, that did not happen people found new ways so i don't think this is going to stop uh, movements for democracy and movements for uh, social justice the people in the game that are struggling need to learn these tools and find how to uh, use them innovatively. So for a while now, people use internet, now governments just shut down internet. Uh, now they have to think of another way. As uh, we'd say, when there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. And I think that, 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 that applies to social movements and this power struggle between government and opposition. We've got literally about 20 seconds left. I, I know you're working on a new book uh, with Princeton University Press. Uh, again, 20 seconds. Can you tell us about it? It's about survival and failure of democracies. I examine which democracies are durable and survive and improve and which ones that fail. And what I find is important is the way democracies come to being. Democracies that emerge out of lengthy periods of protest mobilization are more likely to survive but democracies that are forced from the top or as a result of international foreign intervention are less like, likely to survive that's fascinating and important work i hope when it's published you'll come back and we can talk a little bit more about that he is muhammad ali Kadivar. Thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.